We're, we're pretty much at the limit of, of borrowing at the moment. You are supposed to be the servants of the people. The people are supposed to be your bosses. And to me, the people doesn't even realize that. Good evening. My name is Ralph from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm going to say something that's controversial. CARICOM has gotten in its own way. I want to be very clear that there is a dangerous tendency in our country. This program is talk about the facts. We must bring the facts. Time to face the facts. Hello and welcome everyone, wherever in the world you are watching this program. It's another edition of Time to Face the Facts. I'm your host, Beverly Sinclair, and this edition will be looking at the conflict that happens between Israel and Palestine. Continuously, I would say. You must be living under a rock if you've never heard about it. And right now, I have a very esteemed panel that will give you some information about these two countries. Should we call them two countries? And maybe tell you why this conflict has been ongoing for so long with seemingly no end in sight. So stay where you are, or if you need to go get a glass of wine, a cup of coffee, whatever, some popcorn, go get it and come right back and join us after the break as we get into some facts about Israel, Palestine, and the ongoing conflict. <laughs> Feel good facts. Help prevent cold and flu by washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. That's the time it takes to remove most germs. No soap and water? No worries when you've got alcohol based hand sanitizer. Have you stay with us and for those of you just joining us, welcome. This is Time to Face the Facts. I'm your host, Beverly Sinclair. I have with me quite an, I would say, educated, enlightened, very much knowing panel that's going to take us through the paces as we look at the conflict between Israel, Palestine, should it mean anything to us in the Caribbean. I want to ask the panelists to introduce themselves and just to give you, the viewers, a little bit of information about who they are and maybe why you should pay attention to what they have to say. And we're going to start with Mr. Clarence Baker. Good evening, all. Um, well, Beverly quite eloquently introduced Ms. Clarence Baker. Um, I'm an ex-media worker, no retired, living in England. Thank you, Mr. Baker. We go to Randall Robinson. Well, good uh, good evening, all. Um, I'm Randall, regular citizen of Grenada. Some people know me as an activist. Some people know me on the on the political scene. Some people know me in the in the in the culture and arts. Um, but in this instance, I'm just here to talk about a thing that has concerned me since I was a child. Why does this conflict continue on and on and on between Israel and Palestinians? Thank you very much, Randall. And <coughs> someone who is no stranger to commentary and putting things in perspective, Mr. Alan Bezinski. Good evening, everyone. So I am Alan. And as Beverly says, I am a commentator, self-described. <laughs> and I've had some years of experience on different platforms in this regard. Thank you very much. But Mr. Baker, you know, I thought you would have said something a little bit more about yourself. You know, he's so modest. 
And I am going to ask you to tell us about your book that you have put out. I'm not going to leave it until the end of the program at all. I want it to be part of your introduction. Okay. Well, I've, um, we have just published a book, Steel in Chains. Um, the new edited version will be out in a week's time because the initial copy were just a limited edition. So Steel in Chains is all about uh, the history of the Caribbean, the evolution of the Caribbean, with Grenada at the center, Grenada being the only English speaking island that had a full scale revolution. It touches on the history from slavery through to emancipation, the way forward. It touches on Cuba's assistance to, in Southern Africa. And it's a very, very interesting historical document. Yes, and how can we get copies? Well, um, it, it, it will be, the new copies will be on Amazon or as a house. And when I come to Grenada, I hope then I'll have it uh, distributed in Grenada. And then you will do an official launch and book signing and all that good stuff? I hope so, yeah. I want, um, I'm not sure whether um, I'll be able to come soon because of this COVID, but as soon as I can. Yes, absolutely. We'll surely be looking forward to that, Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker is my old boss, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I used to have to report to Mr. Baker. You remember those good old days, Mr. Baker? A long, long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but here we are looking at Israel, Palestine, and the conflict which has been ongoing for many of us before we were born, and certainly long before that, even in our parents in some instances for boy. And I will start right here with Mr. Baker, since he's already on the floor, or was already on the floor, to kind of put in perspective the, the historical context of this, of this conflict. <laughs> Popularly, it has been said that the conflict began in 1948. So I wanted to speak to that, Mr. Baker, and, and put this thing in a historic context. Yes. Well, the first um, conflict between Israel and the Palestinians started way back in 1920, uh, the intercommunal violence. But it erupted um, in 1947-48 with the civil war. Before 1920, however, Jews and Palestinians lived together peacefully in, in the land. The main problem to, uh, which caused the violence now is that the, the, the European Jews were treated very badly in Europe. There, uh, you know, millions were sent to the gas chambers. They were enslaved and um, they were treated pretty badly. So after the war, um, the West, feeling guilty for what had happened to the, to, to the European Jews, uh, decided to, to, to give them a homeland in Israel. And uh, Palestine at that time was under the British command, and of course, um, the United Nations uh, partitioned Palestine, um, giving both the Palestinians and Israel a homeland. What happened then is that um, the United Nations at the same time, Jerusalem, I should say, and both, uh, Palis both Palestinians and Israel claimed Jerusalem to be the capital. And, um, the British moved out of Palestine almost a year after petition. That left the road open basically mm -hmm. for the Palestinians and Israel to fight it out among themselves. Since 1948, Israel and Palestine have fought something like eight wars. Mr. Baker, we're gonna get to those eight wars. I wanna hear from mm -hmm. Randall who said he has been following this thing since he was a little boy. Randall, what can you say about the background of this conflict that has so yep. fascinated you since then? <laughs> I think the thing that always got me um, from childhood, every time I saw that there was some conflict, it was the Israelis with guns and the Palestinians throwing stones. <laughs> I mean, it, it <laughs> you know, that has always fascinated me. I'm like, 
you know, you read the Bible and all of that, and you hear about all these stones, you know, and, and there's always these incidents of throwing stones, 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 and it's the Palestinians throwing stones and being shot with bullets by the Israelis. Now, interestingly enough, you know, I, I, I decided I wanted to find out what was, you know, where was the, how this thing got started. And interestingly enough, if you go to um, Wikipedia, there, they, they state there that um, the roots of the conflict can be traced to the late 19th century with the rise of national movements, including Zionism. You know, that's when the, 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 um, the <laughs> Jews decided that they wanted their homeland and Arab nationalism. And um, there is a there's quote, quote here. <laughs> Alan, I think you're going to like this one. According to Benny Morris, who is a commentator, among the first recorded violent incidents between Arabs and the newly immigrated Jews in Palestine was the accidental shooting death of an Arab man in Safid during a wedding in December 1882 by a Jewish guard of the newly formed Rosh Pina. In response, about 200 Arabs descended on the Jewish settlement throwing stones and vandalizing property. Another incident happened in Petta Tikva, where in the early 1886, the Jewish settlers demanded that their tenants, and that's, that, that's another thing we need to pay attention to, their tenants vacated the disputed land and started encroaching on it. On March 28th, a Jewish settler crossing this land was attacked and robbed of his horse by Yahudia Arabs, while the settlers confiscated nine mules found grazing in the fields. So, you know, this is where the jackass got involved with the, <laughs> with the, with the mules. And they go on to say that in that story, they can't tell which one preceded the other. So it's been since the 1800s, the 19th century, and things really got decidedly worse, as Clarence has pointed out, from, 1920, from the 1920s with the mass migration of Jews out of Europe into, into, um, into what we will call now the, um, Israel and, and that territory that was known as Palestine at the time. Now, of course, during all this time, they were ruled by the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, mm -hmm. you know. And then after the First World War, they decided to share up the spoils and England got um, control of the territory, Gaza and parts of, of um, Lebanon to the south and over on the East, West Bank and so on. That whole area that was known as Jordan now and so on was under British territory. And then the Jews, they had up to 1947 been trying to allocate lands. The problem was that in the allocation of lands, the Jews who were in the minority at the point in time were given much more land. I think it was 15,000. Well, it right. So the, the, is, the Arabs got 4,700 square, square miles of land to the, to the, the um, Jews getting 5,500 square miles of land and they were in the minority. And that caused a big rift, yeah? And so, but the Jewish, you know, people kept migrating, migrating, migrating. Interestingly enough, though, a lot of the Jews who left Europe, especially in the 19, I think it was coming up to the 1940s, Clarence, um, there were 2 million of them who left Europe, but most of them went to South America and, and, and the US and, and yeah. Australia and England. Argentina and places, yes. Mm -hmm. And Argentina. And, and very few went over to what we know as Palestine, you know, what was called Palestine in those days, because the, the conditions there were quite rough. So it was only later, after the Second World War and so on, that you started to see a huge migration of Jews over, over there. The, when I use the word tenant, the Jews who came over, who, who, who were the first to come in there and to, you know, set up Zion, bought the land, they were sold the land by Arabs who owned the land before them. The issue is that a lot of the, the Palestinians, so to speak, were tenants 
on the land. They didn't own the land. They, 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 they worked the land as tenants. And so the landlords, the people who owned the land, sold the land to the Jews. And that sparked off a whole set of confusion because they felt that we've been working this land for how many years and so on. And, and here it is, it just come. And the Jews who bought the land told them they had to leave. Very interesting there. I want to hear from Mr. Bezinski at this point. His take, or what, what do you see when you look at the historic, all the, all, all the history behind this conflict between Israel and Palestine and the whole division of the land? Because we hear about the West Bank, which is actually the West Bank of the Jordan River, and we hear about the Gaza Strip, which is a little piece of strip on the far western side of that same mass of land. Can you speak to those geographic outlays and how that plays out in this conflict? Yes, but um, I want to go back a little further in history because so far, we are avoiding religion and politics, which are definitely issues ought to be avoided unless you go back into history. And then, of course, you can't separate religion and politics from any sort of historical inquiry. And so when you look at the time when the tribes, as I refer to them, because they're all the same Semitic people. It's just that they have different versions of God. Tough luck. The only people who benefit from that are the purveyors of the stories regarding the true God. And so these people, these tribes, lived in peace. If you go back in biblical times, you will hear about all of these tumultuous tribes who were constantly fighting because civilization as we know it started somewhere in the Mesopotamian valley between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. rivers. That is where men moved. They gravitated from being hunter-gatherers into farmers. And then that provided the opportunity for settlement and the development of cultures and civilization as history will record. So how then did we get after thousands of years into this situation that evolved in the 19th century? It had to do with after the Greeks and the Romans and all of these, the Ottomans, took control of the region, then, as is the case with every empire in recorded history to date, the empire falls in on itself and then is consigned, as the saying goes, to the dustbin of history. And so it was that during the 19th century, when the Europeans had tired for the time being, I hasten to add, of fighting among themselves. And they carved up Europe by the 1870s into what remained national boundaries for a while. They then turned their attention to the outside world. And by the 1870s, they looked at the map of the African continent and drew a lot of lines and said, okay, the Germans will go here, the Portuguese here, and so forth and so forth, and they sorted that out. The problem with the Mediterranean East Coast, however, was that the Ottoman Empire was still there. And the Ottomans, they controlled Turkey. They were, in fact, from time, times gone, hundreds of years prior to that, they were in the Balkans. So that is why you had... Muslims in what came to be known as modern-day Yugoslavia. Okay. Now, by the end of the, the 19th century, because of the pogroms taking place in Russia and Poland 
and to a lesser extent in Germany, Zionism became a thing. And so Orthodox Jews decided that it was time to return to the traditional homeland. Here lies the root of the problem. The traditional homeland was in Jerusalem, except that Jerusalem, after the Ottoman conquest some, what, 900 years previously, the temple had been destroyed and a mosque built on top of the temple walls. Here is the recipe for the disaster that adherents of two major religions both deciding that the same little area of ground was the holiest of holies. And that goes back generations, beyond generations, centuries. But it wasn't until the, the middle to the late 19th century that the Jews had the opportunity presented to them to go back to what the extremist religion considered to be their ancestral homeland. No, so far so good, except that because of the First World War, when again, that started off as a little territorial dispute, an argument between Serbia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, when a Serbian anarchist managed to assassinate the Archduke and his wife, in July of 1914. And because of various alliances, the European powers who were supporting either one side or the other, or in some instances, not because they were supported, but because they wanted to provide a check and balance to Russia, came into a conflict that became the First World War. By 1917, the Russian Empire imploded because of the Russian Revolution. The Ottomans lost the war along with the Germans, and then that provided the French and the British and the League of Nations to establish the first new world order, if you want. And they carved up the area previously controlled by the Ottomans. They had the mandate, the British mandate over Palestine. So as was said earlier, you had Jordan, you had the French in charge of Lebanon, and the British had a lot more. So far, so good. But then, because history showed what can happen when the power of the empire can be diminished. Remember, during the First World War, a fellow called Lawrence went to Arabia and fomented dissension by enlisting the first ruler of the House of Saud. And Lawrence of Arabia made sure that, remember the natural resources then, oil had been discovered about 50 years previously, and it was important that the weapons of war would be lubricated by the oil resources of the Middle East. At the, the underlying reason for all of this is always, and history tells us, it is always the scramble for natural resources. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And the existing population, they can be moved, they can be exterminated, they can be encouraged to fight each other in proxy wars. Yep. Ultimately, it is the economic imperative that drives all of this. And so I would say that this perhaps is the historical background following the First World War, the removal of the Ottoman Empire, which kept a lid on these various rivalries. And so by the time the Second World War came about, the time was ripe for the partition of what was formerly British, the British Mandate of Palestine. Remember, a gentleman who subsequently became a Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, Begin. 
had a price on his head. The British were hunting him as a terrorist. Correct. <laughs> but yet, but yet, Menachem Begin actually signed a peace accord with Egypt in 1978, I believe it was. So, as the saying goes, one man's terrorist is another man's another freedom, man's fighter. freedom fighter. fighter. And this has continued to this day. So, I'll, I'll stop here. Right. And yes. you did touch on the religious and political history of these two nations. But today, we hear of Israel, we hear of Palestine. Which one of you can say how this distinction came about? Because at the very core, they are the same people. All right, let me, let me dive in here then. Um, remember, after the First World War and the, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the area known as Palestine, it encompassed Jordan, yeah. Syria, yeah. Lebanon, yeah. all of that. And then, because in 1917, the British um, Lord Balfour, he made this famous declaration that has gone down in history, that carving an area out of what was previously known as Palestine in the Ottoman Empire would be an appropriate place to resettle all of these troublesome Jews who were really people that they didn't want in Europe because yeah. they were not Christian. Remember, they spent millennia using the Jews as excuses for poor harvests, for rain, for excessive rainfall, and every now and again for sport. They would go and raid them and exterminate them in their villages and so forth yeah. because they were different. No. This is not singular to any sort of country or continent or whatever. We've seen that sort of internecine slaughter happen all over the world. Most recently with the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. Yeah. Um, so it is, it is in human nature to use religion as an excuse to wipe out your neighbors. So we got, we got the State of Israel by United Nations Resolution 242. And that really annoyed the surrounding Arab states. I think it is necessary to say that this annoyance was promoted by the fact that after the Second World War, we saw the emergence of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and its proxies on one hand, and the religious extremists in the United States on the other hand. Because it is not so much that communism per se was, see, was seen to be a threat. It was the fact that it was godless communism. And this godlessness is what provided the fuel for extreme right-wing American administrators and their absolute focus on fighting communism wherever mm -hmm. it should rear its head. its head. No, on the other side, the communists had as much blame to a shoulder as anybody else. It was, I believe, Nikita Khrushchev who was at the United Nations and pounded his shoe famously on the lectern and said to the United States that we he will bury you. Well, that was not to come to pass, but nevertheless, it is perhaps revealing as to the depth of the, the antipathy that these two systems had for each other. And again, fueled on the American side by the unrelenting promotion of this idea of godless communism and the people who were fighting the Lord's fight had right and might on their side and woe betide anybody who came in front of their ideas. We are going to take a break right here. 
That's a very good note on which to pause. And when we come back, we will continue to look at where it all started, how it all started, how it has progressed. The conflict between Israel and Palestine, the people known as the Israelites and those known as the Palestinians. Don't go away, viewers. We will be right back on this edition of Time to Face the Facts. Men are not made to physically abuse women. This is something that has become a serious problem in our country, or has been a serious problem in our country. Abuse could present itself in many forms. It could be physical, verbal or emotional, and the most egregious, sexual. It's not a good look. It's not right in no form. So domestic violence against women should stop. How can you hit a woman, beat a woman? Every form of abuse has an effect on the individual abuse, on their family members, on children, even the community as a whole. I'm a man. I came out of a woman. I love my mother. I love my nieces. So to the children, if you're being abused, talk to somebody that you trust and get your message to the person. This has been a message from the Ministry of Social Development, Housing and Community Empowerment in collaboration with its social partners. If you or anyone you know is in need of help, please feel free to contact us at 440-2269. And remember, a life free from violence is possible. Water up to my belly, mattress floating, furniture floating, even the TV set floated for a while, you know. My sneakers were floating just like boats. Floods, they can happen so suddenly. What can you do? Listen, when I saw the portable toilet from the construction site of the road float by and I realized that all that stuff was in the water. Floods, hazards, take control, reduce your loss. What can you do to help stop flooding? Keep drains and wells clean and unblocked. Find out lots more about floods and other hazards at your local disaster office. A message from the National Disaster Management Agency and Sidera. Welcome back, viewers, to this edition of Time to Face the Facts. I'm your host, Beverly Sinclair. I have with me Randall Robinson, Alan Bezinski, and Clarence Baker. We are looking at Israel and Palestine, how the conflict has come about, where it came from, where it's going, what's unfolding right now between these two nation states. And when we left, I hope you didn't miss the first part of this discussion. It was very, very interesting. We looked at the religious, political, historic context of this conflict. And right now, we want to have our guests speak to the issue of the Palestinians in particular. They do not have a country. They do not have a state. They are not recognized as a people then internationally. And we just want to hear from our guests. Randall, how did they get there? You know, you... Um there was a word that came up, Arab. And the Palestinians, for the most part, identify as being Arabs. So as you, as you said that, I thought, well, who are these Arabs? You know, who are these people that call themselves Arabs? And it seems like they are affiliated with an old Arabic language. But interestingly enough, tradition holds that Arabs descend from Ishmael, who is the son of Abraham. Yes, correct. Right? So the Syrian desert is the home of the first attested Arab groups. Now, Andrew spoke about the Ottoman Empire and so. I'm saying Andrew, Alan. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. So, um, naturally, because they were Semitic tribes and you know, moving from one area to the other, there were more or less nomadic, mo no, nomadic people that moved throughout the region. And because this area known as Palestine is also very known for its rich soil and so on, a lot of them were farming people and so worked on these farms. And as you heard before, they were tenant farmers 
on lands owned by other Arabs, most of whom didn't even live in Palestine anymore. They were absently um, landowners and so on. So I guess it was through the tradition, they, that nomadic life, they settled in these rich plains of, of what is known as, as um, Palestine and have been there for centuries. Now, living alongside Jews, who in that, there were, there were Jews always there as well, you know, but they were in a minority. As a matter of fact, um, very much in a minority at the times when in the 1800s, I was looking at one of the uh, of the of the um, censuses that that you know of the region known as Palestine from 1800s coming up, and the Jews were always in a minority. They, they um, I, I must get it so that I can quote from it, but um, it's the only time the only time that the um, the 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 Jews became a majority in the region is within the last um, probably 50 years or so uh, because the Arabs always remained in this area called Palestine. The problem is that when Israel declared themselves a state throughout history, there was no state called Palestine. There was a region called Palestine that mm -hmm. people lived in, but there was no state. It was not recognized as, as any, um, you know, having the, 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 the functions or the, the hardware that, that creates a state. They had none of that. Um, so when the Israelis declared themselves a state and put all the things in, 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 um, in place for that, the Palestinians were left on the outside in this area that we, we, we called out the occupied territories, right? Where they live, but they, were, they, they never formed themselves into a state. Now, the Israelis recognizing that, look, we need to do something about this and the people need, want self-governance and so on, allow them to have some semblance of self-governance and hence you had the Palestinian Liberation Organization and Fatah and within recent times, Hamas come into the fore. Um, but yet, they, they have not formed themselves into a state. Interestingly, though, 130 countries around the world recognize Palestine as a state. Eh? The three countries that do not are Australia, the USA, and England, I believe, is the third, is the third one who does not recognize Palestine as a state. Yeah. Um, so the UN might recognize them and 130 countries around the world, but three of the major ones do not recognize them as a state. And this is the situation that we are in now. Mr. Yeah, and, Mr. Um, just, to, just to follow up on what um, Alan has said, sorry, I'm saying, <laughs> Mr. Robinson has said. Uh, yeah. Um, we must understand firstly how the Jews came about being a majority. They came about being a majority by the European Jews realizing that they had to go to Ethiopia and the surrounding countries to take Jews, original Jews from those countries and bring them to Israel to boost the population of Israel. Also by the expulsion of Palestinians from the lands that they, yes. that, that they had beforehand. You know, and so the war, the first major war in 1948 started because the Arabs will not accept Israel as being a state, as Rondell has, has just said. That war went on until 1949. But what that war did, Israel being so powerful a, a, an army, when they got victory in that war, they used that victory to expand themselves throughout the territory by, exp by expelling people by taking over lands that was owned by the Palestinian lands and properties that the Palestinians were on. And that is what, that is what the main problem today is all about. There are people, Palestinians, all over the Arab world, living in refugee camps for over 50 years, who cannot even return home. Their homes and properties have been taken over by Jews. You know, and that is the basis of the main problem today. Another dimension to that, you know, um, not only were they expelled, and, and some ran away. Mm -hmm. But what Israel did 
was said, okay, you all out, you have to stay out. We're That's not going right. to recognize you because some of them were had Israeli citizenship. So they denounced the citizenship and they said that even your offspring will not be allowed to come back into the territory. So they were more or less banished a whole hundreds of thousands of, 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 of um, Palestinians to wherever they, you know, they had um, gone off to, to get away from, from the, um, Israel, the Israeli conflict, the conflict with the Israelis. And so they were not allowed to return at all. The same way that Israel was asking people to return to Zion, they, they have not afforded the Palestinians a right of return. So you yes, are right. Correct. Okay, um, I'm going to come in here now. Um, what Clarence was talking about, the 1948 war. Um, this, again, as I said earlier, it's when you have the international community drawing lines on a map. And so the United Nations Resolution 242 recognized the establishment of the State of Israel. Um, however, they were far outnumbered by the coalition of Arab states that surrounded them. And you had the first war. Naturally, the, this war led to the displacement of hundreds of thousands of people who previously lived on the land for a very long time and they lived together. But the, the establishment of the new nation state of Israel meant that it became impossible for these people to remain neighbors. And so the, those Palestinians, because they, they weren't known as Palestinians then, they had to flee or they were driven from their ancestral lands. Many of them ended up in Jordan because Jordan was a very large neighboring territory. Now, as I said earlier, the Cold War is the background to all of this. And so in Egypt, you had a nationalist president, mm -hmm. Gamal Abdel Nasser, who is famous for having constructed the Aswan Dam and thus diverting water resources from Sudan, presumably, and other countries, but also resulting in the electrification of large portions of Egypt, his country, that had traditionally been more or less subsistence farmers. Now, when NASA, who was supported by the Soviet Union, decided to nationalize the Suez Canal, which had been built by imperialism in the 1850s or whenever. He took over the canal. And then, in one of those first instant instances of a proxy war, the British and the French encouraged Israel to attack Egypt. Yeah. No. Both the Soviet Union and the United States, because they want party to this, put a stop to the fighting because they didn't start it. Those fellas wanted any war that started, they needed to know what the outcome was and who would be the people. So therefore, following that, by 1967, the Soviets had armed all of the surrounding Arab states, mm -hmm. Syria. Jordan, Egypt, and the Israelis, being that beacon of democracy in the Middle East, according to the American mythology, was advised by American intelligence that this military buildup all around you suggests that you are going to be extinguished. So in 1967, June, the Israelis took a preemptive strike against the Egyptian airfields, and war broke out. The Israelis reached the Suez Canal banks. Naturally, Jordan joined the fighting against Egypt, 
But air power of the Israeli Air Force is what swung the balance in their favor. And so the famous six-day war was over in a week. Yep. But during the course of that, the Israelis had occupied the Sinai Peninsula, the part of Egypt known as the Gaza Strip, and the part of Jordan known as the West Bank, which had borders with the 1948 State of Israel. Well, naturally, having established these new boundaries, Israel was not backing off without negotiation. And so the negotiation resulted in the restoration of the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt when Egypt and Israel signed a peace treaty. Now, what about the West Bank, which was really Jordan, and all the people who lived there? Remember, they had fled in 1948. They, in 1970, organized an insurrection against the Hashemite king of Jordan. The Jordanian army ruthlessly suppressed that uprising. And that became the origin of the group subsequently labeled a terrorist group, Black September. The Jordanian kingdom decided that the best thing to do with these troublesome people is leave them in the West Bank, let Israel fight to them. So that's the origin of the West Bank West problem. Bank. <laughs> By 1973, the Russians had resupplied, sorry, not the Russians, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics had resupplied their Arab allies, and they decided they'd have a war again. Egypt and Syria organized a surprise attack on Israel which this time the Americans didn't see it coming. The Americans had to provide massive material aid to Israel in order to bring that conflict to an end. After that, the seeds of the current impasse were properly sown because the Israeli extreme right, led by the military, clearly took a decision at that time that never again would they be caught napping, never again would they suffer the indignity of having to retreat. And so they established their positions on the Golan Heights, they moved to East Jerusalem, and they said, these are our borders now. Yep. If you name man, come and take it. Take it yeah. right. And that's and, where and we so are. That's where we are to this day. I am very happy you mentioned Jerusalem because it is not possible to talk about the conflict between these two sets of people without bringing into the discussion the city of Jerusalem because that is the prize. You have about three different major, what they call Abrahamic religions in that region and every one of them want a piece of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Right. And Mr. Baker, I wonder if you could speak to the significance of Jerusalem to these religions and to these people. Well, truly each of the three Abrahamic religions claim a piece of Jerusalem, but more so the Jews and the Palestinians and the Arabs. Um, as Mr. Bizinski was saying, since, um, the f- since the first war in 1948, Israel and Palestine, uh, uh, Israel fought eight major wars, 1956, 67, 73, 82, and 2006, and many other conflicts. And a lot of times it has been over Jerusalem because the Jews claim Jerusalem as their own because of their religious belief that was given to them by God. America supported them in that belief because of the right-wing Christian um, religions in America. But it is a false belief, because if we, if we had to look at it biblical, biblically, who are the children of Abraham? Abraham was, prom- <coughs> it was made a promise 
that his seed will be greater than all the seeds of the sand on the seashore. The Orthodox Jews have not accepted Christ. And if they have not accepted Christ, how could they then claim the land? You know? So the, the religious values that they're using to, 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 to keep hold of Jerusalem is a falsity. And to support and to support it by the right wing in America who blindly support Israel in all that they do because of biblical and uh, misunderstand what they call uh, understandings. You know? And so the major hurdle between any negotiation with Israel and Palestinian remains Jerusalem. And almost every uprising has something to do with, it, with, with um, Jerusalem. Because the, even this last situation here, Israel is making a move to, well, I would say the, America, the last American president single-handedly gave Jerusalem to the Jews. And by doing so, he empowered the Jews to do whatever they want to do because they can now claim Jerusalem as their own. That shows out any negotiation about a homeland for the Palestinian and a capital for the, for the Palestinian. And so even this last conflict here, you saw Israel, Israel started a conflict, even though much, much of the world media have not tackled them on it. They walked into the temple and started expelling people. They, it, again, it was another land rights situation. Israel made a move to expel more Palestinians from Jerusalem in order to expand their claim on Jerusalem. And Jerusalem will always be a hurdle in a negotiation. Yes, but haven't the Israelis... Sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Brzezinski. Yes, I was going to say that um, I think Clarence referred to the temple when he meant the mosque. Is there, the I mosque, I meant the mosque. mosque. My apologies, the mosque. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Because yeah. the, the, the problem with the temple was when Jesus chased the money changers out of the temple, as I recall. No, that's right. That was my error, now, sorry. No, <laughs> with, regard, with regard to these extreme right-wingers, the, the Christians in the United States, who, um, who promoted this idea that Israel has this God-given right to Jerusalem. Um, as you rightly pointed out, the last president of the United States, um, he recognized, he, he signaled that he recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel by arranging for the transfer of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv. To, to Jerusalem. But but hold on a second. Those right-wingers in the States are not the only ones. I remember being amazed at the fact that I saw an article published, published in one of the local newspapers here in Grenada by, I don't know if he's still head of the Assembly of Pentecostals here or whatever, but expressing fulsome support for President Trump because of his move to transfer the embassy of the United States to Jerusalem. And it crossed my mind that these extreme Christian fundamentalists are not only in the American South. <laughs> we have some of them here in Grenada. These people are the ones who are party to fomenting religious strife at a distance they are not the ones who are suffering. In fact, they are promoting the suffering of individuals who are used, as the saying goes, as cannon fodder. Mm -hmm. Listen, I saw some statistics regarding the number of rockets fired by Hamas from launching sites in built-up areas in Gaza. 3,500 rockets, near enough. Mm -hmm. Most of them, 90% of them, were intercepted by the Israeli anti-rocket devices, whatever they call it, so-called Iron Dome. But 10% got through. However, each of the anti-rocket rockets, rocket. which were fired, cost forty to fifty thousand U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. I saw an opinion expressed that Hamas has made a very callous calculation. 
the more rockets that are fired at Israel, the more rockets or anti-rocket rockets Israel has to fire off as well. And at a price of 40 to 50,000 US dollars each time, they will bust them. And it is an economic consideration that Hamas has taken. And as far as Hamas is concerned, just like the Pentecostal extremists here, biblical prophecy will be fulfilled. And in the process, it is irrelevant how many innocent lives are lost. Yes, yeah. So for 200 Palestinian lives lost, including 64 women and children, I believe, at last count, yeah. and 10 Israeli civilians, but Hamas has done the calculation, along with the Iranian paymasters, that it is worth the loss of innocent life if they can cause the Israeli economy to suffer some 60, 70, 80 million dollars in losses. It is just like in the 1973 war. The Arab nations which attacked knew that they had no reasonable expectation of winning it, but they were going to create a significant drain on the Israeli economy, and more importantly, from the Americans who had to replace all the material that was lost. So guess what? Is it really about religion? Or is it coming down to, as has always been the case throughout history, economic power? Because let us now look at the land, as you say. Who does the land really belong to? Does Mr. land Bezinski? really belong to anybody? Mr. Bill. Mr. Brzezinski, before we go on to <laughs> who owns the land, we are going to take another break on this edition of Time to Face the Facts. And when we get back, we will look at that. And also, we want to look at Hamas. Because if I remember correctly, that group was labeled as a terrorist group. So go away, viewers. We will be right back. Feel good facts. Avoid the most common causes of spreading the flu. Cover your coughs and sneezes with a tissue, dispose of it straight away, and either wash your hands or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Hurricane damage is beyond your control. Surviving the aftermath is up to you. Have a hurricane plan. It can save your life and your family too. Prepare for hurricane. Your hair prepare for hurricane. <laughs> Welcome back, viewers. We are looking at the Israel-Palestine conflict on this edition of Time to Face the Facts. And our panel, very, very knowledgeable. I knew they were, but you hear it coming out. You've heard it coming out in the earlier discussions we've had. Mr. Alan Bezinski, Mr. Randall Robinson, and Mr. Clarence Baker, looking at the historic context and all that has contributed to and still support this conflict between these two sets of peoples. Uh, before we went on the break this time, Mr. Bezinski was looking at the whole Hamas effect. And I want him to pick up from there. And Mr. Baker is going to give us a little bit of history on the formation of Hamas and why, how, and who labeled them a terrorist organization. 
Mr. Vizitsky, please continue. The concept of land is cultural. For example, the indigenous inhabitants of the North American continent did not consider the ownership of land to be a thing. The land was there, it existed, and they moved across the land following the seasons, following the animals on which they depended for their livelihood. And from time to time, they would come into conflict with other tribes, and so they would establish a certain demarcation. But it was clear to them that the land didn't belong to them. It was what they could get from the land. So it is a different or perhaps an alien concept to countries that came under imperial domination, as I said earlier, where people could sit down at a table and draw lines on a map. So to whom does the land belong? I have no question regarding that. The land doesn't belong to anybody. It is whether or not there is an acceptance of internationally accepted boundaries. Now, it is regrettable to say that while history affords us the examples of where these boundaries have managed to remain in place and also examples of where they have fallen apart. So for example, after the fall of the Soviet Union, certain states which were previously part of the USSR came into their own, the most notable of which is the former Yugoslavia, which broke up into any number of states and then having established new boundaries, they proceeded to go to war with each other on the basis of religious antagonism, which led to the Bosnian and Serbian conflicts in the early 1990s. You have in the continent of Africa, where boundaries were drawn, which crossed tribal communities, and so given the opportunity from time to time, they will rise up with machetes and slaughter each other, as happened in the Rwandan conflict. conflict yeah. Now, what about what used to be Transjordan and Israel? From 19, after the 1973 war, President Jimmy Carter arranged for a, an initial peace treaty, and that is when the first two-state solution was first put forward. The Palestine Liberation Organization, which came out after the 73 war, led by Yasser Arafat, became the voice of Palestine. But as is often the case with these liberation movements, they became deeply indebted to their sponsors. In this case, the Soviet Union. And as is always the case, again, when money starts flowing, there are allegations of misappropriation, corruption, this, that, and the other. So the PLO began to lose its moral authority. And this is what gave rise to elections, which the PLO eventually lost in the Gaza Strip, mm -hmm. not in the West Bank. Yeah. Hamas became the, in the eyes of the people in Gaza, their legitimate spokespeople. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now, now, now comes the fly in the ointment. Iran. Yes, but before we get to Iran, Mr. Baker is going to tell us about Hamas, that organization, Mr. Baker. Yes, well, as Mr. Bezinski was saying, the PLO became the voice of the Palestinian people. It was with the PLO that the peace treaty was signed. But uh, Hamas started as a community organization. Hamas fostered the support in Gaza by feeding the people and looking after the people. 
And that is where Hamas gained mass support in, in, in Gaza. And so, like Mr. Bezinski said, when the election was called and Hamas won the election in Gaza, it was something that Israel and the United States could not stomach because they saw Hamas as a terrorist organization. Whereas they're able to pressurize uh, the PLO into accepting some semblance of Israel as a state, Hamas never accepted Israel as a state. And so, as Mr. Bilinski said again, the people of, um, of the Gaza considered Hamas to be their, their, their legally elected representatives, but Israel and the West or Israel and America would not. And so pressure was placed on Hamas from the very start. Israel tried to starve the people. Because you must understand that, that, that the, 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 um, the Gaza Strip or the West Bank do not control their own borders. All the borders are controlled by Israel. Even the taxes are collected by Israel and then are handed over. So it is really a situation whereby you have a people who are totally subjugated to Israel as a power. Of course, the conditions in, um, in Gaza deteriorate. And as the people, like um, Mr. Robinson said earlier on, when the people protest, they end up throwing stones at the Israelites. But of course, they, of course, Israel respond with gun and some of the most sophisticated weapons. And each time innocent people are killed, the problem fester and Hamas gets stronger. And so Hamas continues today to be the legal representative of the people. Israel continues to suppress Hamas. They have destroyed the infrastructure several times, hoping that Hamas would lose support. They have tried to starve the people, hoping Hamas will lose support, but Hamas still control a great deal of support. It, interestingly, this, this, um, this, this issue with Hamas, the Israelis kind of took their eyes off the ball, you know, because Hamas, in 1987, there was, a, there was a, 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 an Israeli citizen who was involved in some traffic accident that caused a lot of um, Palestinians to lose their lives. And uh, Hamas was born out of that, yeah. um, you know, trying to, there were six, six, six guys who came together and said, no, we have to do something about, about this. And what was happening at that point in time, Israel was keeping their eyes on Fatah. You remember um, the Palestinian liberal, liberal PLO, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the PLO is made up of factions, Fatah yeah. being the largest faction in the PLO. And of course, with all of these, you know, as, as Alan said earlier, the, the, um, the corruption, these allegations of corruption and so um, led the people, especially on the West Bank, on the, um, in Gaza, to become wary of what was going on with the PLO. Yes. And Hamas, in wanting to do something about their condition over there, started, you know, the, the, the feeding of the people and so on. But Hamas, <laughs> the leaders have Hamas, Used to meet with the Israeli. I think they even met with the Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin on occasion because Israel, at the point in time, was doing something in Gaza where they were collaborating with um, some young Muslim youth and so against the PLO. And so they took the eyes off Hamas and that organization that was building under the underground so to speak right so the collaboration when they thought when israel was thinking that they were collaborating with people who were going to to influence what was taking place with the plo over on the west bank side didn't realize that they were collaborating with people who were extremists in their own right and did not and and and, and so were not going to recognize israel at all as having any kind of authority and being in the place Mm -hmm. So by the time in 1989, when Hamas carried out the first so-called terrorist attack against the Israelis, by um, they snuck into Israel, killed two soldiers, and and and, and, um, and kidnapped one, and kept him over in in Gaza. The Israelis launched all kinds of things to find that guy. They could not find him. Eventually. Hamas negotiated for the return of this, this soldier. I forget his name now. Uh, Shalit, I think was his surname. A thousand, a thousand and something uh, but imprisoned Palestinians were released to get that one soldier. That's know. correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Including some who had caused 900 and so of the, of the people who were released were um, soldiers for the Palestinian soldiers, so to speak. 
who were responsible for the deaths of more than 569 Israelis. Yet they were released, mm -hmm. you know, to get that one soldier back. Um, and it makes you wonder, what's the price of a what's the price of a Palestinian life? You know, what's what's uh, you could get a thousand men for one Israeli soldier. Kind of tells you what the mindset is, you know. And so we look on at this conflict playing out. You have two million people living in 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 how many square miles is Gaza? Um, oh. It's um, twenty miles long. It's probably a mile wide, so it's probably twenty square miles. Twenty yeah? miles, so yeah, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. It's probably a little bigger than than Karyaku, if we want to if we want to, to to talk about that in in size. Two million people mm -hmm. live in that territory, so you could see that they packed up like sardines in there, right? And when and and they don't have um, they don't have a port. They have no access to medical treatment unless they go to Israel. I mean, you know, um, um, well, when I say medical treatment, they will have basic triage available to them in, in, um, in the Gaza Strip. But anything more serious, you need to go to Israel. There were five points that you could get to Israel from, from Gaza. That's reduced to three. Mm -hmm. And on most days, it's only one that you have to go in for everything that you need must pass through those checkpoints. They don't have an airport. They don't have um, a, a seaport. They are blockaded. So you talking about people living in an aquarium, well, almost an aquarium, because you could see, you know, you could see what's going on inside there, unless they probably put up some cardboard on the side of the, the walls of the aquarium. And the Israelis are firing bombs down into the aquarium. You don't think that eventually, even if you think they fish, that the fish are going to take offense? And start to do something to you know to say I live in here, you know, right? And so it continues to to baffle me that we this thing is perpetuating beyond this. And to think of the what the Jews had to face in Europe with all the programs and so on, and to perpetuate that now in 2021 against against people who you could say are in the same kind of circumstance. I mean, really, that that Alana is, is something that always baffles me. Because the Jews will profess they had the worst under Hitler. And yet, they're going to do the very worst to the Palestinian people. Now, if you have experienced such bad things in Europe, why would you want to do the same to other people? You know? And I wanted to just expand on that because we have to also understand that the settlements, the expansion of Israeli settlements, is a major factor in the problem. Yep. Because the way Israel has divided the Palestinian territories, they have made sure that they cannot be united as one. Israel remains in between. Yep. Israel remains mm -hmm. in between, so they, they, they control them in blocks. Yep. Right? And Israel, not wanting to have any real settlement, continues to expand the settlements. And each time they expand the settlements, the, the, the Palestinians take offense. Mm -hmm. the Palestinian youth will rise up. Yes. And when they rise up, then mm -hmm. the most of it is weapons are used against them. Right. Okay, my turn. Yes, yes, um, yes Alan, we're coming. We're ref coming reference, right. was made, reference was made to underground. Um, underground is a useful reference <laughs> with regard to how the West Bank, I beg your pardon, okay. the Gaza Strip is supplied. They have become experts in constructing tunnels, both on the Egyptian side, as well as presumably okay. to receive um, from Lebanon, to receive okay. material from that side as well. So it is not, in fact, that you're looking into a fish tank. You're perhaps looking more at well-established infrastructure because notice that I think Clarence made reference to the fact about all this in infrastructure having been destroyed. But the infrastructure is destroyed after it has been rebuilt. Now, how is it being rebuilt? Built, yeah. And here we go to, I mentioned Iran. Iran and Hamas share one objective, and that is 
to remove the Jewish infidels from the Middle East. Iran and the United States have a long history of conflict because after the Second World War, there was a so-called democracy yep. in Iran, which the Central Intelligence Agency managed to get overthrown, I think, in 1953, and they put in the Shah. Shah and the Shah of Iran provided a thorn in the underbelly of the, of the Soviet Union. And this suited the Western powers because the USSR's expansion into Europe needed a counterbalance. That is what all of these foreign policy theoreticians believed was necessary, starting with the mid 19th century, the balance of power. Every time one country went a particular direction, you juke them on the underbelly or somewhere behind the back where they weren't looking again. And so that is the nature of international relations. But international relations through, first of all, the League of Nations after the First World War, and then the United Nations after the Second World War, had certain fundamental principles. Having drawn the lines on the map, they expected that in order to prevent an outbreak of shooting wars, there would be negotiated diplomatic settlements. Remember, there's a famous saying, war is diplomacy by other means, yes, yes. but the war is unsustainable. However, unsustainable as it is, clearly, Iran run by the mullahs. Remember what they did to the Americans in 1979 when they invaded the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and held the hostages for a year or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. America hasn't forgotten that. And Iran has decided that because of their adherence to their particular prophet who went in the desert and had a vision, compared with the Christians and the Jews who also have prophets who went in the desert and get a vision. But the Iranians are the ones whose prophet perhaps was more recent. And so they decide that their prophet has more relevance than any other body's prophet. Unfortunately, they can't have agreement on that because Saudi Arabia while they claim to follow the same prophet, Shia. have a little difference between Shia and Sunni Muslims. Sunni Muslims yes. So here you have a situation where the Gulf Arab states have prepared finally to accept the existence of the state of Israel, but not Iran. Iran. And Hamas will not accept the state of Israel, Israel. as long as they are bankrolled by Iran. Iran. So guess what? If you have across your fence a neighbor who is dedicated to wiping you out, how then can there be peace? I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and just you, expand on what before Mr. you come in, Ms. Before Sorry. you come in, Mr. Baker, we have to take another break right here. I know that this discussion will just keep us going, but we must take a break. So viewers, stay with us. We will be right back on this edition of Time to Face the Facts. No one should live in fear of the person they love, children included. This is something that is um, really becoming an issue within our country and we need to make necessary steps to stop it. It seems like sexual violence against women and children has become habitual. Abusers, Mr. Sickle. It ain't macho to get on, so I say no, I say no, I say no, no way. This has 
been a message from the Ministry of Social Development, Housing and Community Empowerment in collaboration with its social partners. If you or anyone you know is in need of help, please feel free to contact us at 440-2269. And remember, a life free from violence is possible. I remember when this beach was really wide, a place to picnic and play cricket. And we used to go up to the end to get away from all the people. Now all the beach gone. Coastal erosion. When the sea starts to come in and take the land away, everyone loses something. Granny, look how the waves are washing right under that house. Coastal erosion. It's a hazard. Hazards. Take control. Reduce your loss. What can you do to help stop coastal erosion? For one, don't drive four-wheel vehicles on seaside dunes. They loosen sand and destroy binding vegetation, causing erosion. Find out more about coastal erosion and other hazards at your local disaster office. A message from the National Disaster Management Agency and Sidera. With so much information about COVID-19 on the news, children can become overwhelmed and even fearful, especially if they have a medical condition. As a parent, you can help to manage your child's fears and anxiety. Provide your child with the correct information about the virus. Remind them to wash their hands frequently with soap and water and to cover their cough and sneezes with a tissue or into their elbow. Monitor what your child sees about COVID-19, especially on social media, where the information may be misleading. Be aware of your own response. Instead of panicking or appearing anxious, reacting calmly could help to allay your child's fears and anxiety, and they too will model your behavior. Remember, how your child responds is dependent on you. Welcome back viewers. It has been quite an interesting discussion so far on Israel and Palestine and that conflict which seems to be unending. Mr. Baker, before we took that break, you were going to expand a little bit on what was said by Mr. Brzezinski before we went out. Yes, the situation with, with Iran and the Palestinians and Iran and a greater part of the Middle East is one which is very, very um, daunting. And when it comes to America, they would do anything to crush Iran because of the same problem Mr. Um, Zinsky alluded to. But also, what has happened is, in the whole of the Middle East, Israel is the only country allowed to have a nuclear bomb. Now, if you remember, Israel developed a nuclear bomb in partnership with South Africa. During the apartheid regime in South Africa, Israel conspired with South Africa. South Africa provided Israel with uranium and Israel provided South Africa with um, the technology to build a bomb. So South Africa had a nuclear bomb in South Africa, the only country that had a nuclear bomb and Israel developed a nuclear bomb inside Israel. Now, South Africa before Nelson Mandela was freed had to give up the nuclear bomb because America would not stand for any African country having a nuclear bomb. Iran, on the other hand, is determined that they too want to build a nuclear bomb because the only thing that can, that can, that can um, match them equal with, 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 with Israel. And so America is adamant that Iran should not have a nuclear bomb. Israel is also adamant that it should not happen. And the division with the Gulf states is that because the Gulf states fear Iran, they side with Israel. And so the problem has become even more serious with Arabs siding with Israel against other Arab states and so on. Having, having said that, though, bear in mind that the Iranians do not consider themselves Arabs. They're not no. Arabs. They're no, they do not consider themselves Arabs. No, that's right. But interestingly, I was, I, I was, I was reading here that the Americans actually in 1957 provided nuclear material to Iran. Yes, yep. because they had the Shah. The Shah, the Shah was mm -hmm. yeah, the no, Shah. Then... Yeah, exactly. Yes, and um, gave them the the, the um, all that they needed to <laughs> to be able to fashion, if you like, their own nuclear bomb. Um, of course, there was that falling out, and then I uh, told you, was it Khomeini who took over? And that's Khomeini was that, the one. Yeah, yeah, Khomeini is he, the he, one. Who he took was. Over. 
Yeah, he was the one who saw himself as the natural successor That's to right. the prophet, peace be yeah. unto him, yeah. Yeah. and that they would then proceed to reestablish the reign of Islam mm -hmm. throughout the known world. Yeah. The, problem, the problem with the Ayatollah and all the mullahs is that their idea of the known world is, is rooted in the 8th century. Yep. And so they really ought to have little relevance. If you look at what has been happening in Iran, there is, what, two generations now of younger people who have come up chafing at the bit because they want freedom from these ancient religious extremists. Yep. But, but remember that with the Revolutionary Guards, it reminds me of the situation in Venezuela. When the late Hugo Chavez yep. provided a 40% salary increase to the army to ensure that he and would remain in lawyer. power. <laughs> and so in Iran, you have the Revolutionary Guard. They get the best of everything while the masses see trouble. But that is the nature of dictatorship, whether it is right-wing extremism or religious fundamentalism. That is the nature of it. That is why you can get a retired U.S. Army general musing in public <laughs> to the effect that why can't a military coup take place here in the U.S. just as it yep. did in Myanmar? Mm -hmm. yep. The problem with extremism is that it brooks no rational argument whatever. Yep. You cannot, you cannot have any sort of engagement with extremists. And so, regrettably, in spite of the fact that for 75 plus years, the solution has been there, two states. Yep. When, the British, when the British decided, in furtherance of the, the, well, it was a collapse of the British Empire, even though the British didn't realize it at the time, but after the Second World War, the empire was no more. And India became the obvious place, the largest area of the world under British domination at the time, mm -hmm. became the area for a post-colonial independence experiment. Yeah. And India was granted independence. Yeah. Lord Mountbatten was the last viceroy of India. Yeah. Well, religious extremism, the Muslims and the Hindus refused to live together, even though under British rule, they had lived together yep. within the same borders. But it didn't happen. And so there was a partition between India and Pakistan. And the Muslims went to Pakistan. The Hindus who were in the area that became Pakistan moved to India. Moved to India. Hundreds of thousands of people died. Then these Muslims weren't satisfied. The ones on the eastern side now declared independence from Pakistan and set up Bangladesh. A godforsaken place where every year the monsoon comes in and kills 100,000 of them like nothing. Yeah. 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 But they don't miss them, apparently. No, because yes. they could make another 100,000 every year. You know? And so... <laughs> <laughs> but gentlemen, you have talked about Hamas, the Iran effect. We mentioned earlier that 130 countries really support Palestine to become a state. But in the midst of all of this conflict, where is the support for Palestine? Who comes forward to train the Palestinian army and to fund them and to arm them and to ensure that they are fit for battle? But Iran. Iran is the only real backer of the Palestinian when it comes to military assist or the Palestinian when it comes to military assistance. I'm sorry. Yeah. They, 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 remember, we want to make a distinction between the Palestinians and Hamas. Yep. Yeah, Hamas. If Hamas, yep. mm -hmm. if, Hamas, if Hamas is a proxy for Iran that is Iran, dedicated yes. to the destruction of Israel, Israel, then there is little hope. That is That's why, right. as I was saying, we've had the solution staring us for 70 plus years. Two states. Mm -hmm. Yep. We saw that India and Pakistan, by the way, both India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons. 
Yep. So that is a question of mutually assured destruction. Short destruction. Now, in the one case of Iran, Iran wishes to acquire nuclear weapons, not for defense, but for aggression. Yep. And so, bearing in mind the history of what has taken place in the Middle East, I think it is fairly obvious that any time they get close, the Israelis will take preemptive action. And these days, it doesn't have to be by an airstrike. It's called cyber terrorism. Um, yes. I believe there was something in the news fairly recently where there may have been some cyber attack on the nuclear um, ambitions of, yeah. of, of Iran. Um, that was blamed uh, by the by the uh, blamed on the the Israelis. I think I saw something like that, or was it the Iranians attacking some nuclear facility in in um, in Israel? There's something going. There was something no, yeah, recently yeah, yeah, that's going on. The other way around. Yeah. The other I think, way. I think, I think, yeah. I think the I think the, the, the um the the hackers. Yes. Presumably, um, the Iran either suffered a hack attack. Yes, or or something blew up, maybe due to their own incompetence. Who knows? Well, well, it was blamed on a, a on a cyber <laughs> on a cyber attack, so they got into something that caused it to blow up. So that's been going on. Um, but remember, Hamas also has has Muslim Brotherhood roots, eh? and uh, so they were supported by the Muslim Brotherhood and some of the mosques. Who are loosely affiliated with other um, with other entities in the in the in the Muslim world? So it cannot be just just Iran. They're getting help from other entities. Um, they were born in that, and 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 so that is happening. Though so per perhaps the majority is coming from from um, from Iran. The other thing, though, is. Um, this two-state solution, as you mentioned, Alan, earlier, was reaffirmed by the United Nations in 2012 and agreed to by all of the Arab countries right around Israel, but has never gone in, has never been put into effect. No, never. because Hamas, Hamas will not accept it because it is a fundamental article of faith with Hamas and Iran that the Jewish infidels must be exterminated, removed, that the state of Israel, by definition, is an affront to Islam, or at least to Sunni Islam. Right. Sorry, wrong, wrong Islam. Shia, to Shia, Shia, to Shia, Shia Islam. Islam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Because the Saudis, the Saudis brand of Islam is that it's all about the money. <laughs> yeah, and you, you have to understand that Hamas, Ham, Hamas, um, is, it, it, it may be seen as left-wing terrorists and things like that. But Israel is very far right-wing, so you have two very, two very um, opposing forces: the far right and the far left, who but will hold, not hold on, each other. hold on, Clarence, because having brought in the issue of money, the Israeli government, and hopefully. Netanyahu is about to lose office. To his office. Yep. Right, yeah. yep, yep. Going back to Prime Minister Rabin, who was yep. assassinated by Thank an you. extremist Israeli settler. Mm -hmm. Rabin was a promoter of the two-state solution because That's remember, right. you had you had first of all Jimmy Carter's um peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. Then you had in 1993, you had the Oslo Accords Accord, yes. with Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. You remember Yasser Arafat, Arafat. shaking hands. hands with the Israeli prime minister. Yep. Yep. And as a result, an extremist exactly. Israeli settler assassinated Ethan the prime Yasser minister Rabin. of Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these extremists on either side, as you're saying, Clarence, they they are committed to hindering any resolution, but extremists ought to be in a minority. Yeah. And that is why there is currently some hope, because this latest coalition, which may form a new government in Israel, for the first time actually includes an Arab-Israeli party along with the others. Yes. Who knows? Who knows? But the sticking point remains that unless 
the neighboring states are prepared to accept the existence of the state of Israel, then peace will be a pipe dream. Can you imagine if 50 years ago, say, that the, there had been a negotiated settlement and that Israel had withdrawn to the pre-1967 war borders, yeah. the entire area could have been so much more advanced. advanced. Yep. Right now, the advances in the economic advances have taken place in the Gulf states and in Israel itself. Yeah. Israel is a center of technology and economic activity in the Middle East. It is an example of what can happen when there is peace. Peace. But not for, I was going to say, <laughs> it, well, are you saying anything? <laughs> you can't, religious, religious extremism a, is not concerned with peace, but no. only the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. But interestingly, I was reading, Alan, um, I, I think I saw on, uh, um, something on, was it? It's either MSNBC or CNN last night. Um, that this coalition, the only thing that they are united on is to get rid of Netanyahu. <laughs> That's the only thing. And that my the friend, guy who is the enemy of my enemy, enemy is my friend. Is my friend. <laughs> and how oh, oh you think? How oh you think we're going to get rid of? <laughs> I get you, I get you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but here it is, here it is that they are saying that they are um, the successor, maybe even more um, right -wing. an extremist, more mm, right wing but, than Netanyahu. But, but he only got two years. Yeah, that is true, that is true. He only got <laughs> yeah. two years, but they can um, do a lot in two years. And because of the coalition, there is there, there's some kind of control. You know, it, no, no, it, not control. Checks and balances. Checks, checks and, and balances. balances. Yeah, checks and yeah, checks and balances. But it just occurred to me that you realize now. Okay, so the West Bank, while there is still unrest in the West Bank, it's kind of settling down. Um, Jerusalem has always been that hot spot for everybody. Um, and Netanyahu, I guess, because he was seeing his political hopes vanishing into the twilight, uh, probably stirred up that confusion, this last set of confusion with the Al-Aqsa Mosque and so on around the end mm -hmm. of Ramadan, um, so that this conflict would have catapulted him back into popularity and so okay. get him back, um, you know, so there, there was that as well um, in the mix. However, if Gaza continues to present an insurmountable obstacle to peace in the Middle East. I'm not talking about just um, in Israel, but in the Middle East, because now you find that the Arab states surrounding are now coming together to buy into the peace and the prosperity that peace affords. Gaza may be sacrificed. And so they better know <laughs> what it is they are doing if they continue to be a proxy of a place like Iran who wants to get rid of Israel. I'm but just saying. Clarence, Clarence made the point earlier that yep. Hamas came to prominence because they were feeding people. Yep. We are familiar yep. with the concept of eating a food. Food. And this is how you get people to follow you. And the people <laughs> remain downtrodden and oppressed. Hold a second there, Alan. So the Hamas group started out as an NGO and then it became a political <laughs> organization. Don't go there. <laughs> good, good segue there. <laughs> you see, I'm just highlighting that the concept is not new. <laughs> no, it's not new. It's not new. There, there is nothing new about new it. Under I, the I was... <laughs> I was looking at a Latin phrase the other day. I can't remember the exact Latin, but the English translation is for God and country. And it is well known. Not only is it the motto of a secondary school here, but it is a motto that has been used for organizations for a very long, long time. time. Typically for educational purposes, sometimes for military purposes. So I am always concerned 
when I see forgotten country, because the most recent place I saw it was as a backdrop of that right-wing convention addressed by the retired general, general. Yep. Mr. Flynn. Yep. Yep. And so you get these people who promote forgotten country, or in the Islamic context, they are soldiers of the prophet or whatever it is. And they have their agenda. Some of us don't know whether their agenda has to do with objectives on earth or in heaven. <laughs> heaven. Because some of them seem to be in a big rush to get to heaven. heaven. Yep. What nobody has <laughs> let them know is that the promises that mm. used to await them in heaven, all of them finished. <laughs> 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 you know, okay, we gentlemen, don't, I mean, I, gentlemen yes. we are going to take our final break here on this program. <laughs> and when we come back, we will just have time for you to give your final comments on this whole Israel-Palestine conflict and anything else you want to throw in the mix. Viewers, don't go away. We will be right back. <laughs> Hurricane damage is beyond your control. Surviving the aftermath is up to you. Have a hurricane plan. It can save your life and your family too. Prepare for hurricane. Your hair prepare for hurricane. Coughs and sneezes spread diseases. So cover coughs and sneezes, please. Not with a rag or bandana. They trap germs. When you use the rag again, you put germs on your hands and everything else you touch. When you cough or sneeze, cover your mouth and nose with tissue. Throw the tissue in a bin and wash your hands afterwards. If you don't have a tissue, cough into your sleeve or elbow. Alcohol-based hand sanitizers are also effective in cleaning hands. Welcome back, viewers. You are watching Time to Face the Facts. And the facts we are looking at are those surrounding Israel and Palestine and that conflict which has been going on for longer than most of us here have been alive. I have with me a very esteemed panel, Mr. Alan Bezinski, Mr. Randall Robinson, Mr. Ferenc Baker, and we have certainly surfed the historical context of this conflict. And right now, we're going to hear from them as they give their final thoughts on this program. Not the final thoughts on the issue, just for the sake of this program, because, you know, we are constrained by time. So we're going to go to Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson, you were on the floor before we went to the break, so I come right back with you. Okay, I, I just wanted to um, to make, take a dig at Alan um, on the General Flynn issue. And just to say that, imagine the American military would have promoted a gentleman of that kind of thinking into the general ranks. It's amazing. <laughs> you know that that has happened. Uh, given all that we know of the American military and the, and the, and the, uh, the hierarchy. But anyway, so that's something to, to, um, to, to, to think about. Uh, coming back to our, our conflict, you know... Um, I'm glad in a kind of way that, you know, it's 2021 and the world is waking up to a lot of injustices across the world, uh, you know, across, across this space that we live in. And it was very interesting, like the Black Lives Matter protests that we saw happen. Um, Palestinians and people who support what is taking place 
across the world. And I mean, you know, they came out with the flags and you could see for the first time that they are represented almost in every major um, capital of the world. You can find Palestinians or their descendants, you know, people who who um, identify as, as Palestinian or a Palestinian descendant. And they are, they are legion across the world. But it also goes to tell you about how dispersed or what the dispersion has caused. You know, it's like seeds that you spread all over the place and then they, they, they you know you, you find these these trees growing up in areas that you did not expect them to grow um and so that social media and all that it represents and this nationalistic fervor that is sweeping the world at this point in time is bringing focus you know to to their issues and the things that that are happening and i don't think that they it the Israelis have an opportunity now to face the reality and deal with the this um, uh, accusation of apartheid, of this apartheid regime that they are running in, in their neck of the woods. And so I'm hoping that um, good sense prevails. I'm really hoping that these new guys, the new prime minister and, 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 and his coalition, will bring some semblance of, of peace. I hope that Hamas will do some recalculations and realize that they are a small piece of the of the puzzle at this point in time and may jeopardize their actions may, may, may jeopardize all of their lives in that Gaza Strip eventually if the world is pushing towards a peaceful you know um, a peaceful resolution of these issues and um, of course that will render the likes of Iran irrelevant in the whole scheme of things because they are just one, you know, and without a nuclear deterrent, they are open game to a coalition of forces. So, you know, I don't know what the geopolitics, you know, is going to is going to say about that, but I would think that everybody needs to pay attention to what is going to, to happen in that part of the world as we go forward. Yes, and remember that Iran has its own problems otherwise. Yep. With sanctions and other economic pressures that have been put on it over the last yep. few years. And you mentioned that mm. the social awareness is coming about. We've, we've had some interesting sayings throughout this program. And one of the interesting famous sayings is that injustice anywhere is injustice, injustice everywhere. everywhere. And it's one of the reasons we in the Caribbean need to pay attention to what's happening not just here in our homeland, but what's happening across the world. Do not underestimate the power of social media, media in all of this. Over the years, we have been led to believe by media reports that have come out about this conflict that Palestine was the aggressor or the Palestinians were the aggressors. And as social media bring more of the news from underground, and you have news outfits like Al Jazeera going in with a more unbiased viewpoint. And we really look at what is happening there. We can see the imbalance in the conflict where the Palestinians are not as well armed or well supported as the Israelis. If you look at the body count, it's like 23 Palestinians die for every well, one Israeli. Israeli. So it is really, really an imbalance. Uh, military and a social imbalance what is happening there but i want to hear from mr baker mr baker as we come to wrap up this program what is kind of your prognosis how do you see this going forward well it is my hope Beverly, that the world have not given up on the two-state solution because it seems like israel has given up on it it seems like america most times have given up on it as you said before injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. And the Palestinian people deserve their own state. They deserve to live in dignity. Saying that, I do not want anyone to say that I'm anti-Semitic. What I'm saying is Israel deserves a state. So to the Palestinian deserves a state, a home. And that will only come about by mutual respect and understanding the needs of each other. Therefore, there must be a negotiated settlement. This is not possible as long as we have the antagonists like Iran and other forces uh, playing against it. However, I do believe that change will come because the success of the Palestinian state or the Palestinian people is dependent upon peace. And there'll be no peace if 
if if they are under attack from Israel and Israel under attack from them, and it is a dream to think that the Palestinians can move Israel out of the territory. Israel is there to stay. Therefore, there must be a negotiated settlement that brings justice to both sides. Thank you very much, Mr. Baker and Mr. Bezinski. You will have the last um, word. Those, those points Clarence has just made are echoed by a former Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs and Justice Minister, J.P. Livni. She was the chief negotiator in the last two rounds of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. She has written an essay just this May in the New York Times, and I will just quote two short paragraphs. The argument over historical narratives hasn't changed. It won't. Those on both sides that insist on forcing their narrative on the other side or turning the conflict into a religious war cannot make the compromises necessary for peace. This is true also for those from the international community supporting one side and denying the rights of the other. This is destructive and only strengthens extremists. Peace, based on the vision of two states for two peoples, gives an answer to the national aspirations of both the Jewish people and the Palestinians and requires compromises by both. So Clarence could have written this himself. Is that it, Mr. Bezinski? That's it. That's it. <laughs> all right. Well, I thank you all, gentlemen, for sharing your insight and certainly your knowledge of what is happening in the Israeli-Palestine conflict. A religious war can never be won. There is no war that can ever be won. Singing Sandra, that was one of her famous songs. The war will go on. It cannot be won. As long as people continue to fight, there is no winner. There is absolutely no winner. And I agree with the sentiment expressed here. Israel deserves to be its own state. Palestine deserves to be its own state. And there has to be some coming together of reason. You have rested some hope on the coalition that's coming forward now in Israel that that will make a difference, but there has to be some table where reason sits and all the ideologies are put aside. You just cannot continue waking up every day to bombs dropping on your country. You, you don't know who's going to die next. I looked at a documentary with the effect all this is having on the children. So many orphans, so many disabled children suffering as a result of conflict. And you hear about these international organizations that just seem powerless in everything. They just, it just continues on and on. We're in 2021. And as we've discussed here, this thing has been going on for more than a century, more than a hundred years. It has to stop. It needs to stop. And we call on all the countries, all the international organizations, and all the citizens of the world who know what peace is, who seek justice everywhere, to do what you can to end this conflict and to have some peace in the Middle East. And that's our program, folks. So happy you could have stayed with us for this edition of Time to Face the Facts. And we invite you to join us again the next time another edition of this program airs. So long for now.